It's the Rink Live podcast for another week. I'm Jess Myers along with Mick Hatton. A big thank you to our sponsor, NCHC TV, with the uh, NCHC playoffs heating up. Uh, that's the place you can go for all the coverage of that conference. We're going to talk about another conference today, the uh, WCHA final faceoff is this weekend at Ritter Arena. Happy to be joined by the number two team in that tournament, but uh, some would argue number one in the country based on uh, a fantastic regular season. Nadine Muserall, the head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes. How are you, how are you doing, coach? Great. Busy time of year with birthday parties and um, postseason play. So all good. <laughs> you, you are the consummate hockey mom. So, uh, you know, I know I know you you balance uh, all, all, all the kids you have uh, that, that wear the uh, scarlet and gray there. And then you uh, balance your own kids at home, too. Well, it makes it easier. They always say if you want something done, ask a busy person. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. I mean, uh, just talk a little bit about this season, uh, you know, because, you know, on, on paper, like like Jess was saying, you know, there are people that think that you, you your team might be the, the best team in the country, you know, going into the into the playoffs. Uh, you know, overall, I guess, uh, just how has the season been for you and what have been things that you've liked about this Ohio State team? You know, um, I got to hand it to this squad in particular this year because I felt more like a general manager this summer with the transfer portal, you know, changing and us taking the opportunity with the money that we saved and allocated to uh, players on our team and to incoming players. Uh, there was a lot of question about that, of how we would play together. And um, that wasn't something that I was too worried about, just knowing the returners and the leadership that we had on the team and they would handle that very well. Uh, I think this year, the biggest difference from years past is our goal scoring. You know, we're averaging five goals a game. And last year, I always felt like it was a nail biter, even when we were dominating. And this year, we've uh, changed that tide a little bit and have done a very good job also on our special teams. And, you know, when you come head to head to the teams in our league and how close they are, those special teams are going to matter. So having the best power play and one of the best penalty kills, I think, has been transformational for us in our success this year. You've got uh, a big matchup with Wisconsin to, to start things right off and, and you've played the Badgers pretty recently. What What's the key there when when, we, when you face that uh, Wisconsin team, you know, that that is having a down year by Wisconsin standards and it's still obviously a very, very dangerous team. Isn't that funny? It's a down year and yet there's still like three, four in the country, right? So <laughs> right. I mean, uh, obviously a very good team with, um, you know, they have a great tradition uh, even when I felt we were doing very well on that Saturday game, you know, the shots were 45 to 23 and we only won it 2-1. And to be honest, this, this is a type of team that you could be up to nothing with a minute left in the game and they could score two quick goals and tie it. I mean, they just have that offensive power. So uh, we just constantly tell our team to never take your foot off the pedal because they have such great talent up front that it, it's never over until it's yep. over. I, you know, when, when you look at uh, the, the season's team, you know, one, one of the things that, that you know, pops out, uh, the individual awards came out uh, earlier this week. Uh, Sophie Jacques ends up be, being named the, the Defender of the Year in, in, in the uh, WCHA. I, 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 I'm very curious to hear. I mean, she had four points last season and she has 54 this season. What the heck is, is, has flipped the switch for her? I don't think it's just one thing, but if I had to put my finger on it, you know, it's your senior year. You have to step up. You've got some of your best goal scorers gone now to the Olympics and graduation. And I think she's just taken a lot of pride in that. Um, she always had it in her, but I think it's one of those things like with many young women is once they score one or two, it opens the floodgates and it comes with confidence. You know, I think there's a lot of talented players out there, but do they really possess that swag, that confidence to get it done. And I, I think it really also started when she was on our power play. We put her in a position to have opportunities to score and, and she can now. She's really come a long way, not just um, as an offensive defenseman that people would say she is, but she's also, you know, like plus 45 in the country. She's number one in the country and a plus minus. I mean, her role is to stop goals. It's not to score. So the fact that she's only a few points behind the number one, you know, point player in the nation is remarkable for a defenseman. And I just think that she's taken a lot of pride in her position and she really wants to win. She's tired of, of being a bridesmaid and she really just wants to 
have that opportunity to take the bull by the horns and be the leader of this team, a very silent leader, but um, it's important to her. That's McCat and I'm Jess Myers. This is the Rink Live podcast. We're talking with Nadine Muserall, the head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes women's team, heading into this weekend's WCHA uh, final faceoff. I've got to ask, you know, let, let, let's go back to the early days of, of you starting hockey. You know, you're from the Toronto area. You and Brad Frost have that in common, by the way, both, uh, both from, you know, Canada's biggest hockey market. Uh, originally, tell me about what the scene was like as a female hockey player in the 1990s there and how you wound up, uh, you know, picking an American college and going to the University of Minnesota? Yeah, great question. You know, I just like to give a plug out there to Brad Frost. He was the one that gave me the opportunity to start coaching in college. Um, I know sometimes I probably wasn't an easy uh, player to coach at times, and I, I respect that a lot more now that I am a coach. <laughs> so we did grow up uh, in uh, neighboring areas, but we didn't know each other because he's so much older than me, of course. But uh, <laughs> we, um, you know, it it was just part of our tradition in Canada. You know, I have an older brother, Darren, that played, my dad played, and we built a rink in our backyard. Not the style of rinks they build now. I'm talking thumb to hose and staying out there and just flooding the grass. And then you'd be skating on it. And next thing you know, you hit a patch of grass because it's melted, you know, and you just go flying into the snowbank. So um, I just grew up, grew up playing hockey and just for the pure love of it. I, I absolutely just loved it, playing street hockey with my brother and all his friends. And, you know, I was the only girl I had to change in the bathroom. And um, I was like that up until I was a teenager. Um, I actually went on to boarding school um, in grade nine and then at uh, in New Hampshire. And then uh, Laura Halderson had found me there. And um, I was really looking actually at UNH and Northeastern back then. Those were the powerhouses in the mid nineties. And I just, um, love the idea of Minnesota starting their own program and being part of the inaugural team. I'm, I tend to take a path that others don't. And I really loved uh, the opportunity to help build a legacy. And then when you walked into at the time, that's where we played as Mariucci Arena, 3M now, um, it just showcased very quickly how Minnesota loves their hockey. And I wanted to be a part of it. Sure. How, how, diff, how difficult was that, uh, you know, to, to, to go to boarding school at that, at that age? Uh, you know, was that, was that, I mean, that's a long ways from home, uh, a different country. I mean, there's a lot uh, you had to kind of take on there. I did, but I mean, my mom's looming around this house somewhere. She would be the first to tell you I needed it. <laughs> so, um, but I was fortunate. A couple of my girlfriends on my team went with me. So I did have some familiar friends there and, at the end of the day, now that I am a mom, I can respect what she chose where it was uh, a big picture of what my path was gonna look like. It wasn't just about hockey, it was about school and you know, getting on the, um, the right path. Nadine, I've gotta ask you, uh, you know, one of the big moments in the WCHA this, this season, and, and this is one of those years where anybody could obviously beat anybody. You know, there's a, right. there's a clear top half and a bottom half in this league. But one of the bigger upsets this year was the Bemidji State win against your team. And I've got to say, one of the boldest moves I've seen from a coach in a long time. Tell us about that overtime and your decision in a tie game to pull your goalie. And, you know, obviously it, it didn't work out the way you envisioned it, but tell us about that game. You know, it came down to us doing our math ahead of time, of course, and understanding yeah. what it was that we needed to do to win the conference. And this was going to be our first ever conference regular season win. And um, again, it was one of those games that we were out shooting the opponent, opponent very heavily, Bemidji. And uh, it was also one of those games their goalie played out of her mind. I got to give her a lot of credit. And um, the last minute of play was complete dominance and our faceoff percentage was very high. And so when we won the faceoff in the neutral zone and we got a good shot on net and we still had about 20 seconds left, 17 seconds left, um, I trusted in our, our, cap, uh, our centerman, Gabby Rosenthal, who's Faceoff percentage is really high. And, um, you know, you got Sophie Jakes out there. That's one of the top points players in the country. And the odds were with us, honestly. I mean, I wouldn't think lightning would strike twice on the same spot like that. But um, we looked at each other on the bench and we just said, you want to go for it. I mean, we're here to win. And we want to we want to leave that legacy that we always talk about. We want to win the conference. Are you with me? They all wanted to do it as well, you know, the team. And so I think it just really showcased our belief in them and, and them um, wanting to do it. So we did pull the goalie. 
Um, I don't know if he actually saw the last two face-off plays of how the puck literally went across the goal line and then kicked out. So the puck shot in the corner. And I mean, if this girl is left-handed, it would never happen. She happened to be right-handed, got the puck on the correct side and flew it down the ice. And with 0.3 seconds, she scored. So, um, you know what? We knew that we were going to end up, we'd had to win that game and we were going to play Wisconsin the following weekend anyways who we were fighting for that position for second so we went for it I don't regret it I mean never would I have thought it would have ended that way but it did and kudos to her that'll be a moment for her for the rest of her life too they're uh, they're calling it the miracle on ice in Bemidji the latest miracle on ice <laughs> well you're welcome Bemidji you're welcome <laughs> one, of, one of those just crazy moments go ahead Mick. it really was yeah. Uh, Nadine, before, before you got to Ohio State, uh, you know, the season before 10, 25 and one, uh, you've obviously, I mean, there's been a huge, uh, you know, sea change uh, at Ohio State since you've been there. What were, what were things that once you got there, you know, were, were kind of first on the priority list or for, you know, trying to put your stamp on the team and kind of trying to move it forward? Oof, that's a loaded question though, Mick, but a, a good one. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to be delicate about it being the Ohio State, me coming from Minnesota, another Big Ten school. Um, I feel like there is the Big Ten and then there's the Ohio State. It's just like it feels different. And did I drink the Kool-Aid for sure? But um, I, <laughs> I just um, I watched and observed the first year and I felt like we had some talent on the team. But these young ladies really wanted to win. They just didn't know how to win, you know, and um, they just looked broken and beaten up a little bit of tired of the same old same old like no matter how hard they practice or what they do it was very unlikely that they would beat the Gophers and the Wisconsin's back then and so I had to um, find a balance of embracing their culture and continuing that but then also put a spin on of what elite looks like and what excellence looks like and so I mean again you're coming from OSU where it's really around you everywhere you know not just with football and, and basketball that get a lot of the attention that's a lot of sports we have 36 sports and I have to give a lot of credit to Diana Sabo who hired me she was the senior deputy athletic director at the time who's actually now the deputy commissioner of the Big Ten so she's kind of a um, big woman on campus at the time and she helped guide me like to be honest with you uh Mick and Jess like I didn't really know anything about the behind the scenes stuff, you know, the resources you could have, what you could ask for, what you could really get. And um, I learned a lot through Diana. And again, knowing when you have a really good football program, as we do, uh, resources are endless. And one of the biggest, boldest moves I think we had to do was um, sit down. I, I sat down with the captains and I said, What's it going to take? It's going to take a lot more than you just showing up to practice and doing what everybody else does and putting in your two hours, two and a half hours a day. Um, I said, it's going to take a lot more. And if you really want to be successful, how are we going to beat Wisconsin and Minnesota when they have a whole list of U18 kids to our maybe two or three? How are we going to do it? And it became about fitness and sacrifices. And um, one of the big things is we don't drink during the season. So that if we are going to come to a game, we're going to go head to head. We're not going to lose because of fitness. It, it's, it's never going to happen. We will outwork our opponent. I always think of us as like we're rocky. You know, we're going to get hit. We're going to get beat up, but we're going to keep standing and we're going to keep coming after you. <laughs> you. You mentioned Ohio State and the resources you have. You know, one thing that Steve Rollick has talked about on the men's side is that that Ohio State logo is recognizable to any kid in North America, thanks to the football program and, and how highly visible they are. You know, what kind of advantage does that give you in a women's hockey standpoint when you go out to recruit and, and you have a roster that's that's very diverse with, you know, Canadians, Minnesotans, Michigan kids, you know, I, it seems like you draw from just about everywhere. But what a, what is it like to, to walk into a, a locker room and, and talk about Ohio State hockey? Well, it's a lot easier now than it was when I first started, obviously, because when you win, they start to come a little bit more. But um, I think like, I think that's a great point that Ralph's made is o OSU is um, global and everybody knows it. And then once we can get them on campus, we can sell them based on uh, it's not just the resources athletically, but everything academically and leadership and then for life after. So they have a plan for everything. So the money that they have, it's not just about 
you know, uh, hey, we have money, but they use it intelligently to towards their student athletes. Because Gene, our athletic director's motto is they're representing us when they get out there, you know, and, and we want to make sure that they it, it's a good look. So um, I think it helps now that we've been a little bit more successful, but uh, OSU wasn't really recognized in the women's side, you know. Um, I think we've sure. just grown that over the past five years, but the name in the school was. Um, and then you want to give credit to those seniors and the, and the girls that graduated last year that took the chance on that team that were good, like the Tatums, the Emmas, you know, that were good, that uh, Spooner from years back, uh, Tessa, that were really good um, because they fell in love with the school. I think it also helps, too, with those kids in particular. They're five hours away from home, too. That, that 2017-18 season, uh, you, you make the NCAA tournament for the first time. You take them to the Frozen Four for the first time. Uh, you know, in, 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 just uh, talk a little bit about, uh, what, you know, putting that that season together and, and, and uh, you know, what, what kind of went into that? What was, I, 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 you know, I, I remember watching the, the, the championship game in the WCHA and, and, and the joy that you guys had there. But uh, uh, just talk a little bit about that season and, and, and uh, what that has meant for this program. I think a lot goes into the captains and the leadership that we had that year. Um, I mean, honestly, people talk about culture, but on, if you don't have that and you don't have the talent compared to everybody else, the odds aren't with you, you know, of course you need the, the horses to pull the cart, but they can't be fighting each other either. And so I feel like um, our team, honestly, I just don't really like drama, that Mickey Mouse stuff and, and they handle it and they're very good about it. But um, I would say I hired a really good staff that year. I've had really good staff since my second year. First year, it was tough because I just got hired so fast and there's a lot of transition, but my second year I pressed pause and I looked um, at options because I had time and I got Melissa McMillan somebody that I knew and, and Adora as a hockey player and then I had Peter Elander and unfortunately you know Peter's house um, took over him and he couldn't uh, continue to coach with me but I mean he still calls me tells me how to run my power play but um, you know like um, I think that the, the staff and getting it right was a big big contributing factor to our success. I've got to ask, uh, you know, I wrote about this a little earlier in the year when the Gophers went there for a series, but OSU Ice Drink, it's kind of a legendary place in, in women's hockey. And and I know that, you know, it's its like all buildings, it's got some quirks and you kind of use that as a as a real home ice advantage for your team. Tell us about the, the rink and, and just kind of what goes into making it such a tough place for people to play. I don't know, Jess, your background looks like one of those rinks too. What rink that's, is uh, that? that's, that's the Paul? rink I grew up in, uh, in Warroad, Minnesota. That, oh, that rink has been okay. demolished <laughs> for 25 years. But, uh, but yeah, that's where I grew up. That's my, uh, that's my fake background. <laughs> no, but like that rink, I, I feel um, it becomes a very intense atmosphere. I mean, I've been on the other side as a former player and a former coach where that rink's very hard to play in. It feels small. Everybody always argues it's a small rink. It's actually not. I mean, it's speaking of Peter, Peter's gotten out and actually with the measuring, uh, you know, one of those um, measuring sticks that clicks every time that you, they use in track. I mean, he was so annoyed with people saying that he literally walked the rink and it is the exact dimensions, but our neutral zone feels tighter. Um, but you know what we have? Um, we have a really good fan base. I mean, uh, when we were playing Wisconsin, we had to turn turn um, about 100 to 150 people away because they couldn't fit in. So once you get everybody in there, we've had bands in there numerous times. We got a great family, um, you know, support system where they're tailgating out in the back, you know, and, and taking in all of what OSU is about. And um, they, when that rink is packed, it's a very difficult ring to play in. And honestly, the first couple, first year, it wasn't really like that. But then again, as our success grew, it became actually a really good um, tool for us because I think the most games we've ever lost there in one season is three. Wow. Mm -hmm. What, uh, you, you, you had a tr tremendous career at, at, at the University of Minnesota. You, you played a little bit, you know, uh, over overseas. What, what made you make the decision, I guess, to, to, to quit playing and, and, and go into coaching? Yeah, you know, um, when I finished at Minnesota, probably like most kids, uh, you were riding the train of like, I love, you know, all the free stuff we get and everybody's taking care of me as an athlete and this is a great time. And then in a blink of an eye, it's over. And what do I do with the rest of my life, you know? And I was lucky with my 
uh, mentor being Laura Halderson, you know, who started the hockey program at Minnesota, um, guiding me and helping me. So I became a coach um, at a boarding school, uh, Northfield Mount Hermon out in Western Mass. And I just, I studied family therapy, adolescent behavior. So I really knew I wanted to work with, you know, teenagers, younger, younger kids and, um, and to be able to combine that with my passion of hockey. Um, I always thought I understood the game very well. I always thought that one of my better qualities was, um, being a leader and, 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 um, you know, I, being a little fierce too, I guess, is that, you know, combining all of my attributes and trying to make a career out of it. <laughs> so <laughs> why not coaching? Um, but I honestly, um, I think after my dad passed away, when I was uh, 30 years old, I, I really wanted to get back into the coaching after I was playing. I really wanted to get back into the coaching because I knew that was more long-term. And, um, you know, I, I think that was the right move for me. And, you know, ever since I became a mom eight years ago today, um, that I feel like I've become a better coach being a parent now. You know, it's very similar. You're going to love them. You're going to take care of them, be very loyal. But you're going to have to hold them accountable from time to time. We're talking with Nadine Muzzerall, head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, coach, in the run-up to Hockey Day Minnesota, when you played outdoors in Minneapolis against the Gophers, I, uh, I interviewed Liz Shepherds, who's, who's one, of your, one of your Minnesotans on the team. She came back for a, for a fifth year, the COVID year this year. And I think, you know, two-part question. Number one, you know, what, what has her presence as a veteran meant on this team this year? And number two, let's talk about that Hockey Day game. And, I, you know, you looked as cold as anyone I've ever seen at an outdoor hockey game that day. You, you looked fantastic, by the way. You were dressed up. <laughs> And, you know, the, the, they had the, the special jerseys for that day. But uh, but man, did you look cold out there? Well, you know what? You never get used to the cold, no matter what. Right. How long you've been there, how long you've been away. You just never get used to it. But to talk about Liz Shepard's first. Um, that's a special kid for me because she was not even recruited her senior year in high school. And I remember sitting at Fogarty, talking about another cold rink and um, watching, you know, the elite league that Winnie broke Brown, my best friend, my college roommate um, has created for these young girls in, in uh, Minnesota. And I was just sitting there and I'm like, wow, this girl has a lot of great qualities. One of the best qualities I saw that she had was she shot from the kneecap down. And you very rarely see that in, in hockey, but especially girls hockey. And she was very successful with her, with her shooting. And I said, okay, you know, like, I know, like, if we can get our hands on this kid, we can, you know, fine tune some things and, but goal scoring, that's a t difficult one to teach. And so um, she came to us, she started on the third line, her first two years, and then she started, we moved her from wing to center to complement Tatum and Emma, you know, and try to be that buffer between the two of them. Cause they're very different um, players. And so I'll tell you what, she was first line center, um, you know, the, the lot, her junior and senior year. And it, I would say that was arguably one of the better lines in the country. And um, she doesn't look for a lot of glory. She just does a lot of the right things. She's a 200 foot hockey player. She's tough. I mean, I don't know if people know this story, but she blocked a shot when we played Duluth last year and when we beat them seven, two, and she blocked a shot late in the game and they x-rayed it and leaned on it and didn't see anything wrong with it. And then when we played Wisconsin, she heard a pop and it snapped and she broke her her arm and she had about um, a plate and seven screws in it. And then four days later she was playing in the, against BC. So she is just a tough warrior and she does all the things that you ever need from a human being, but you know, a player as well. And to go back about how cold I was, I mean, we had James Wisniewski on the bench, you know, former <laughs> NHLer. I love that guy, but he had never obviously coached in an outdoor game. He might have played in an outdoor game, but he was wearing dress shoes and he took his dress shoes off after the first intermission. I mean, his toes were white. I felt like if I touched it, it was going to break. So I think if anyone was colder, he had me beaten that that day. <laughs> I, I feel bad, by the way. Uh, I waited to, to interview you after that game. And, and stood Ooh. outside and talked to Brad Frost and some others. And, and you were the last person I interviewed. We, we went inside a trailer where it was warm, thank goodness. Uh, yeah. We had a nice long interview and when we got done, I realized my recorder had actually frozen up. So I got none of that audio. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's such a great moment um, to play in, you know, the outdoor game. Um, I don't know if I'd ever, and I told the commissioner, I don't know if I'd ever 
use it to count against points in, in the league. But I think that would, that's something that is such a moment, especially for those Minnesota kids, you know, even on Sunday, stay and play like three on three hockey or do something fun because it is a special moment for sure. Sure. When, you know, after, uh, after you, you quit playing, you were obviously a tremendous player. And then you, you, had, you start coaching, uh, you know, uh, out, out of the prep school, uh, Sometimes that can be an extremely difficult transition, you know, for, for a lot of real, you know, the, the list is long of, of people who have been really good players, but are, are, are not really good coaches. Right. I mean, because some of it is like, uh, you know, well, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Because you're able to, uh, you know, for, for, for you, what was, what was the toughest part, I guess, about, you know, just making that transition to trying to, to coach younger players and, uh, you know, and, and, and get used to that. Uh, make it still a transition. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you, I, I think um, the toughest part was, um, for me, I went to a boarding school that was not very talented in terms of hockey. And we talked about rinks earlier, Jess, this is an outdoor rink with like just tarp on the side. So I, I went from the cream of the crop with, you know, being at Mariucci to uh, an outdoor facility, legit outdoor facility. So, um, you know what, though, um, I poured a lot into that because I, I was 22, very passionate, um, just came from, you know, a national championship team. And um, I just wanted to express so much of my knowledge to them. But again, understanding that they couldn't compete at that level. I found other ways to connect with them so that they could improve. And it was just little, little goals, you know, and it was um, their individual little goals grew to team goals. And then kind of like my first year at OSU to my second year, right? Just going from seven in the WCHA before I got there to five, my first year and just creating those little goals. Um, but the biggest thing was just connecting with them. I wasn't much older than them, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, trying to find that balance of separation of coach and player, but then also trying to connect with them um, personally so that they would trust and respect you and play for you. And um, I think the hardest thing for me um, was just um, trying to get, uh, sorry, the easiest thing for me, I think was um, I, I learned differently growing up. Like I had to see it. I had to do it. I had to touch it. I had to like visually do it and, and, and see it. And so um, I've taken that part of my learning as a kid into my coaching. So some of my players might be able to hear what I say and get it right away, but I'm still drawing and I'm still going through all the details. And so I think that that's helped with my coaching. Um, they might not like it. <laughs> I don't know, but it's worked so far, but uh, yeah, I think you're right though. It is challenging um, some things over others when, you know, for me, I think the most challenging part is, okay, one thing I was good at was goal scoring. And I feel like a lot of girls nowadays, they shoot in the gut or they always want to go high and they miss and they, they either get nervous in those areas or they just, you know, um, don't have their head up. And I think playing with boys hockey really helped because it was a game of flow and it wasn't so predetermined. I think sometimes young women, it, um, they're like robots. If you tell them, Hey, go here to here to here, they'll do that. That's why our PK is good too, right? Like they'll do that. Whereas the offensive side is just creativity. And I think playing with the boys really helped with that. Hmm. Sorry, long-winded answer. But no, yeah. that's, a, that's a great answer. <laughs> Okay, so the Olympics are over. Canada wins the gold medal. U.S. gets silver. I've got to ask you, because I ask Brad Frost this question all the time. Being a, a native Canadian, but living in the United States now, but having coached people like Amanda Kessel, and, and you know, yeah. you, you're kind of straddling the fence here between the two countries. So when it's the USA versus Canada, how do you handle it? Well, to be honest, I married a man that was in the military. Uh, my kids are American. My son wanted his birthday to be red, white, and blue. So I've been around, you know, America as much as you possibly can. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for everything that the U.S. has done for me in terms of academics and career. But when it comes to hockey, not a chance. Like, I got to go for Team Canada. <laughs> well, well with, that, with that said, do you know Marie Philippe Poulin? And can you talk her into retiring? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know her personally, but man, is she sensational. I just can't, 
I just adore her, like just how she plays and her leadership and having Emma, you know, so close to Emma here, you know, at OSU, she, she just says such great things. I mean, what a talk about what we were just saying about girls trying to score and being clutch. Is there anybody better than her? She's unbelievable. No, yeah, I you're right. They, they probably uh, want her to retire, but she's the type that could be 40 and still be crushing it, you know? <laughs> so if, uh, if we've got the tournament this weekend, if my memory serves me correctly, you beat the Gophers in the tournament in Ritter last season. And uh, you're 2-0 this season at Ritter, uh, having swept the Gophers there early in the season. I know you're not looking past Wisconsin. It's a, it's a one-game thing. But what do you have to do to win two games uh, this coming weekend? What's going to be the key for the Buckeyes? You know, one of the good things, I guess, that we do in our league, and I mean, it's favorable to everybody, is we play each other two times in a row anyway. So, you know, whether you're playing Wisconsin, Duluth, Minnesota, it's going to be tough. But um, but you did just answer, like, we just got to focus on Saturday and Saturday alone against Wisconsin. But, um, you know, we have our philosophy of how we play. We play fit, we play fierce, we play fast. We're, like, constantly, you know, um, aggressive. But we do tweak and fine tune things based on who we play, based on what they do, right? And so over the years, you tend to know each other a little bit. And, sure. you know, um, it's good and bad. But that's where, you know, I challenge my team sometimes too. I'm like, okay, Pettit, what hand is she as a centerman? Okay, you know, what about... Oh, um Casey O'Brien what is she and so they're supposed to know so they're being students of the game of like because yeah I know but I'm not out there so we just challenged them a little bit on thinking a little bit instead of just reacting but yeah it's going to take a lot you know um because honestly I think you guys had said earlier it's anybody's game I mean like one two three four it, it's so tight and and it's fun and that's the way most sports are, to be honest with you. I mean, we've been rare in women's hockey to have such dominance between two, three teams. That's not the norm in sports. And that's not what we like either. That's not what fans want. They, they want excitement. So, and they want OSU to win. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as usual, when we start talking hockey, 30 minutes just flies by. We, we better wrap this up because I know you uh, you have to pack it and catch a plane to, to the Twin Cities. But uh, really appreciate this time today and uh, wish you best of luck at, at the final faceoff. Uh, I will be there covering for the rink live and we're, oh, okay. we're going to have a team on, on staff. So uh, really looking forward to that. Nadine Musrell, head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes. Thanks, coach, and, and, and good luck to you. Hey, thanks very much. Hopefully we run into each other. <laughs> that sounds great. That's uh, that's Mick Hatton. I'm Jess Myers. This is the Rink Live Podcast for another week. We want a big thank you to our sponsor, NCHC TV, and a reminder to catch all of our content on the rinklive.com.